Okay, we're cool. All right. Let's see, and I'll start sharing my screen. All righty. Welcome to the March Elementor Gwinnett County Meetup. I'm Carrie. Um, I'm your host, and Brian, wave yourself. You're your host. He's the co host. Um, let's see. I'm getting to see all that good stuff. Oops. The, the meetup is going to be about 90 minutes long. And we like to keep it personal. So if possible, use your video when you're speaking. And when you're not speaking, please mute your mic. Um, I think I've already indicated that the, the session is being recorded and will be shared after the session is terminated. It'll be tomorrow sometime. I'll send out a link to all the people who've RSVP'd as to the link to the, the um, video. And of course, we have, if you want more information about that, call, I mean, uh, email legal at elementor.com. <laughs> I'm not sure what they'll tell you, but there you go. Um, I've already introduced um, myself. I'm Kerry Wolf. I run a WordPress agency called WP Wolf Press here in the Atlanta area. And, um, can uh, make sure everybody make sure they're muted um, if you can. And uh, Brian, you want to say something about a little bit about yourself? He's the co-host. You're muted. It sounds like actually it doesn't sound like anything. So I guess you're muted. Sorry about the, that, you guys. Couldn't get myself unmuted. Um, hi, my, my name is Brian Griffin. I run a small uh, marketing and promotional product company here in Atlanta, Georgia, called Print Co. Um, been been in business for about ten years and been co-hosting Elementor Gwinnett for about a year now. I'm glad cool. to be here and doing an excellent job, by the way. Thank you, sir. Okay, and. Um, Elementor likes us to gather a little bit of information about the people who are joining us for these meetups. So I've got a, this where you are on your Elementor journey is a cue to me to, um, I'm going to do a real quick poll. It's only three questions. Um, and if you could just take a moment and answer them, I would really appreciate it. So I could pass this along to the Elementor people. So um, we'll see. And so it should be appearing in front of you. How would you describe your level of experience or expertise? Um, are you using Elementor Pro? And is this your first time joining our meetup? Okay. I don't have it in front of me, Brian. How many participants do we have going right now? Oh, I can see we've got 38. Can okay. you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, but I can I I could I could I could see it. So we'll give it another 10 seconds and we'll stop the poll. Okay, here we go. And then I'll let I'll let you I'll share the poll with you. So you can see, it's like most of the people are, it's an even spread, it's intermediate, uh, good. Most everybody's using Elementor Pro because a lot of the cool stuff we like to do is use Elementor Pro and got about a, we got a 50-50 split on, um, on the, um, is this your first time with us? So. Good to see all the new people. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that. And I'm going to close that down and we'll move on to the next thing here. Okay, we've done through that. 
introductions and tonight's topic is speed up your slow elementor website part one part one's important because this is such a huge topic uh, we could probably do six meetups on this topic um, but we don't want to go crazy and i realized that there's all kinds of folks with different levels of their journey through elementor um, you know some people are just starting out or maybe they're just curious about Elementor. And then there's people who are kind of been doing it for a while, still exploring and maybe have built a website or two. And then there's some people that are professional website builders and are using this all the time. And um, so in an effort to try to be able to help and be informative to everyone, um, we're going to, Part one here is going to be mostly just basic stuff that sometimes people maybe already know, but it's a, it's some things that some people just don't think about. And because I'll take over a, a website and find things that um, some of the things I'll talk about will address. So we'll go through that and time allow, we'll have Q and A and then we'll wrap up after that. Let's see. So why do we want to speed up the a website? What difference does it make? Well, the most important thing when we talk about speed is the user's experience of speed. Um, when I go to a website, you go to a website, does it feel like, do I have to wait? Do, do things happen? Because people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. I read something about a year ago that said on the internet, the average the attention span of a, the average user is somewhere approximating that of a goldfish. So they don't, they're not very patient. Um, and they want to see what's, you know, feel like something's happening. So we're really interested in the user's experience of speed. Um, so Improving the user's experience of speed will, it'll reduce your bounce rates. They've got st statistics and I don't have them in front of me that um, just by a 10th of a second of, of load time could increase your bounce rate by 10% or somewhere around there. Uh, it will increase your conversions. Like if you're trying to get somebody to make a purchase or to click on a lead magnet or to press contact us or join our email list um, how, how quickly things happen makes a huge difference and it is will improve your Google SEO ranking um, and it will officially improve your SEO ranking come May because Google has announced that what they call page experience signals will be um, rolled up into their algorithm in ranking. But all that being said, the user's experience is most important because the algorithm reflects user behavior. Because Google wants to pr provide the best information, the most useful, the best experience for their users. So if on your website people are having a good experience, you know, that will be reflected in how long they stay on your, your site, how long they stay on your pages, do you click links on the site, and Google you know, you know, can see all that. And um, so you take care of the, the user, Google will take care of you. Uh, unless, of course, your competition is paying $10,000 a month in Google ads. So, so, but it, it's really important. So what can affect the perceived page speed? So I've got a website. What what things are going to make it fast or slow or could affect it? Well, there's the the level of speed optimization that we've done as we've built our website, and that's something we can have some impact on. Um, and that's largely what we're going to be talking about, uh, particularly in part two. Um, the host server speed. We're going to talk about hosts and what to look for in hosts. But if you've got a, a slow host with, you know, sh shared server running 
300 websites on one server and just cheap hosting that can affect it. But then there's things that we don't really have that much control over. Uh, there's variability in internet or Wi-Fi speeds. Maybe your user is at home watching it up in their office and their three daughters downstairs in the rec room are all streaming movies on their iPads and their bandwidth is being eaten up. Um, sometimes ISPs have issues and the, the speed, I'm sure you've all had uh, situations where your, it seems like your internet speed is slowed down for some reason um, and you don't understand it. And if you use things like Netflix or Hulu, your pictures are all going like this because they're using the internet. Um, the user's internet connection um, may not be that great. Um, maybe they, you know, maybe some people have fiber optic, but other people might have, you know, fifty megabits or twenty megabits. Or they may be on a cell phone out in the the badlands of North Dakota on a 3G network. Um, you just you just don't have any control over the user's connection. And then there's the user's device. You know, um, some devices. You know, it could be a 2005 Dell laptop. Um, I know that my wife and I have been on some Zoom meetings and and. You know, I, I have a, an iMac, which has got a pretty good uh, connection. I mean, we have the same Wi-Fi in the house, but and she'll be on the same Zoom meeting, but she's got a Chromebook, and the Chromebook doesn't seem to have a very good setup with the Wi-Fi, so her screen will be locking up all the time, uh, losing sound. Um, so I really, these the user's device, we have no control over, but the things we can control or affect in a positive way, the level of speed optimization we do for our website, and we can make good choices about who hosts our website. Go here. Okay. So we're going to be looking at some testing, briefly kind of covering test ways to test your speed of your site. But what do the test results that we're going to be looking at mean? Is it worse? We'll see A, B, C. You probably have seen it. Um, what do they they mean? Uh, what's important? Um, well, in general, you should focus on the actual load times, not scores, uh, because the scores are taking up all kind, looking into all kinds of technical things. But we're watching the load times. Um, the visitors only care about how long it actually takes to for your site to load. Um, in terms of actual load times, you'll see different numbers. If you use something, you can go to GT Metrics or Google Page Insights, and you can test your site or somebody else's site speed and do it, you know, back to back to back within, you know, do it three times in 10 minutes, and you'll get variations in the speed, um, and sometimes huge variations. Um, and I think sometimes that is largely due to fluctuations in, in the internet. Um, but we can get an idea of where we're at. Um, in general, you want to pay attention to both fully loaded times and uh, how long it takes your entire site to load. And then the user experience metrics, Google's, Google's kind of phraseology, then the user experience metrics such as largest content contentful paint or otherwise LCP which measures how long it takes your site's main content to become visible even if your site is still loading before the below the full content in scripts so when they say uh, main content you know when you have let's say you have a, a laptop or a desktop what you can see on your screen when the page is loading. Now, you want to get that filled in as quick as possible. And other stuff, you might have, um, maybe you have a portfolio page or a portfolio site. You've got 20 images 
uh, tiled on your page. Well, you, you want to get those ones at the top loaded right away, and the other ones can be loading, but the, customer, well, the user doesn't know that because they can't see it. Um, so that would be the largest contentful paint, and that's, that is one of the um, what Google is beginning to term web vitals, by vital uh, measurements. So let's look at how scores and all that kind of stuff work. One of the, the more popular um, speed testing things, although it's more of the more simpler ones, and they've changed their interface here in the last few months, is uh, GT metrics. And, and I just threw up a do test on a site that I've got in development right now that actually did pretty well. Um, it doesn't have a CDN hooked up to it. It's not been optimized yet, but it's still, it's still doing fairly well. And you can see this red box that I put around here. These are web vitals. These are some of the things that are going to be what Google grades on. And so we want to pay attention to those. And that largest contentful paint um, came in seven tenths of a second. And we can look at um, you know, when we get different times, time to interact with on load time. And then fully loaded time is 5.3 seconds. But that's to load all the stuff all the way down the page. So the, the, the user doesn't really see that. So then we go to, this is, um, if you go to GT Metrics, this is further down the page. And if you click on the Performance tab, this can, um, you can see kind of what they're looking at. We were looking at, we've talked about this before, the first contentful paint. Google says a good user experience is 0.9 seconds or less. Well, we're at 472 milliseconds, so we're good. Speed index, how quickly the content of your page is visibly populated, 1.3 seconds, and we're doing good there. Uh, largest contentful paint, um, 1.2 seconds, 0.7. Time to interactive, total blocking time. Now, this is always, at least I think for many of us, a big bugaboo or one of the hardest things to, to deal with. What this has to do with is if you've ever looked at these kind of metrics, websites have to load uh, scripts and CSS files and all kinds of things at one time. And sometimes, depending on how the site is built and how things are laid out, the loading of the CSS and the JavaScript can slow the page build out. And that's what this is talking about, um, the total blocking time. And it's a good user experience is described as being 150 milliseconds or less, and we're in here at 177. And this cumulative layout shift is kind of a weird one. Um, so how much your page layout shifts as it loads? I, I don't see that much, but I guess it's an issue. Anyway, these six things are um, going to be, according to the, some of the latest stuff Google has leaked out, these web vitals are going to be used in their new performance score ranking factor. For you to get either good, uh, to, to get a performance score boost based on speed, you have to get all six of these, either green or light green. And, um, and if you miss just one, you don't get the boost. It's all or nothing. It's like a toggle. Guess no. So as far as Google's concerned, these are important. Now. Here we have, um, this is GT metrics. Then we're gonna go to an entirely different beast, which is uh, Google speed, Page Speed Insights. 
and look at that. Got a nine. What the heck happened? Um, well, first of all, this is um, testing for mobile. And, and one of the differences between uh, GT metrics and page speed insights on mobile particularly is they throttle the 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 um, the transmission and uh, and it goes through it I put in here what they describe it as is kind of uh, doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people but these they throttle them the connection to roughly represent the bottom 25% of 4G connections and the top 25% of 3G connections. So, you know, there's people using all different kinds. So um, this needs some work. And then if we go to the desktop, it's better, but it still needs work. And I've got a, the next slide is something that I found very, very interesting. See that I've, down here I've, I've uh, highlighted, it says C calculator. So if you click on that, you'll go to this page. Um, and the thing that I think is cool about this is it, it tells you what they're, what, what they're waiting, you know, not, not like waiting for the, the bus stop, but waiting, like how much weight they give it, um, these percentages. So they give the 25% to the largest contentful paint, and they give 25% to total blocking time. So, and then 15 and so on. The least important is the cumulative layout sh shift. So I found that very, very interesting and uh, very helpful to um, know to prioritize as to what's what's important, and um, but a curious thing to me, and it might be some page insights experts here that could clarify this for me. Um, look at these numbers. The this says 1.6, which is equivalent to 1.6 seconds. It's green. 3.3 seconds green. 2.4 seconds green. A score of 90. If you go back up here, those numbers are the same, but the score is 52. I, I don't know if that was a glitch or what the deal is, but um, the takeaway at this point is, for me, the most important is, un is being clued in as to seeing what's important as far as these metrics and how they're weighted as we are um, beginning to prepare this for the new Google algorithm. So we've talked about all the different things that can affect the speed of a website. What can I do to speed up my Elementor site? And there's some basic areas you can address to improve your website speed. You can choose your hosting wisely. Your WordPress version makes a difference. The theme you choose makes a difference. Your plugins make a difference. How you handle your images make a difference. And if you have a CDN or a content delivery network, it helps a, a lot too. And I'll go into more detail on what exactly that is if you're not familiar. So these are some things that we can deal with, um, basic things. Now next, next uh, meet up in part two, we're going to go into um, all the different ins and outs of um, op optimization plugins. There's a bunch of them and they're very, a lot of check, check boxes and dials and things to change, but we're going to, we're going to get our basic house in order first. So let's talk about WordPress hosting. Um, if you can, it's a good idea to have a WordPress, uh, your WordPress site hosted with a host that is optimized for hosting WordPress. Um, and I've learned this from experience. Um, I, when I first started building WordPress sites, uh, but that's probably been about 10 years ago now, um, 
I had a reseller account with HostGator and it was cheap. It was like $29 a month for all the sites I wanted. Um, well, I've learned you get what you pay for because, um, I guess at that point I had 20 ish websites that I was maintaining and, and I had, um, uptime robot going on the sites to tell me if the sites were up or down. And one day I was at work and all of a sudden my mailbox filled up with such and such sites down, such and such sites down. It was like just <laughs> filled up my mailbox. Every site went down and every, there was some kind of screw up in the software update and every reseller WordPress site in the entire HostGator network crashed the worst job in the world at that point in time was to be on the support staff at HostGator and um, it took a while for the sites to come back um, two or three hours there was one site that came the, the most important site at that time that I had was for a local city it was the city website for people who are in the Atlanta area, it was for Loganville. And it was one of the ones that went down. And when it came back, it was broken. Um, there was some things screwed up in it. So I decided to bite the bullet and buy quality WordPress hosting. And I had had some experience with WP Engine through some um, working on some sites for other people and was impressed with it. So I went over to WP Engine and I've been very happy with them. Um, but there are other WordPress uh, specific hosting um, and other people can chime in if they have somebody that they really think is awesome. Kinsta has a really good reputation. Flywheel, is a, who's actually owned by WP Engine now. There's SiteGround. Um, just kind of do your homework on are these people WordPress centric? Um, like I can speak to WP engine specifically, they only host WordPress. So their servers are, are fine tuned for WordPress. Uh, they're not running Joomla sites. They're not running Drupal sites. They're not running HTML sites or anything like that. It's all WordPress. And one of the, enjoyable things about it is when you call technical support, the people actually like their jobs because they're all WordPress geeks and they just love talking about WordPress and they love trying to figure out your, the solution to your problems. Whereas back when I was with the other hosting company, you never knew if the person you got on uh, technical support would know anything at all about WordPress because WordPress was just one of 20 things they did. So I think if you can, um, uh, find a WordPress uh, centric or somebody that specializes in hosting WordPress websites, you'll do yourself a favor in the long run. On your, your hosting platform, it would be a great, it'd be great if you can have it be running the PHP 7.4 or later. Um, what, why, what difference does that make? Well, when I upgraded, I guess it was been six or eight months ago that I upgraded to PHP 7.4 and without doing anything else, I could notice uh, without doing any tests or anything, I could visibly notice that my sites were all faster. It just, it's a more efficient way of processing the PHP, which is the, code in the background that actually runs WordPress. So if, if they have it, you know, um, go with P PHP 7.4. Um, I think the previous versions were like 5.6 and then they went to 7.3 and now they're 7.4. You want to look for a host that has a wide distribution of server locations. Do they have servers all over the country or all over the world? Um, do they have a server close to you? Do they have a server close to your clients? 
um, because even though the, our connections go theoretically, well, not the speed of light, but they're going, you know, some of them going through big cables or fiber optic, they're going really fast. But if, if they have to go a thousand miles, as opposed to going 20 miles or 50 miles, it's going to make a difference. And then if the user is not near one of their servers, that's going to make a difference too. So to have a good spread of, uh, server locations. Do they use page caching? Now there are plugins for page caching and and they can help, but it's really helpful if the host itself has page caching and has it set up to where that you can easily clear your cache um, when you need to, because cache can get in the way sometimes when you're working or if you're developing or making some significant changes to a website. Um, does it use gzip compression? Most of them I think do now. Um, gzip compression is used to reduce the size of things that are text oriented like JavaScript, CSS and HTML files. And that can reduce the size up to 90%. Um, does your WordPress host use HTTP2 protocol? Um, that's been out, I think that was standardized in 2015 or somewhere around there. Um, and it used to be that for regular HTTP protocol, it would be like every time there was a request, it was one transaction. Okay. It'd go back and forth and back and forth and HTTP, HTTP2 kind of gathers them all together in one bundle and pushes it out. So it's faster. And then. Does your uh, WordPress host have a CDN? Um, and I'll explain more detail what that is, but basically it distributes your static content across servers or across the world so that um, if somebody is in Mumbai and they're looking at your website and they have a, uh, their CDN has a server in Mumbai, you will, it won't have to travel from the server where you live to there. It will travel just across, maybe across town. So it will, it will make things faster that way and takes a little bit load off the, the, the server, I think. So then in WordPress, just something real simple I wanted to mention. You know, we always say make sure you're running the latest version of all your software and of course with WordPress um, because they're always adding improvements and making things better. But a, one that relates to what we're addressing this evening is that with WordPress 5.4, they began to support native lazy loading um, for images. And lazy, for those that are not sh familiar with lazy loading, it allows your website to only load images when, until the user scrolls down to the specific image. So back to my first example about, say you have a whole, you've got a portfolio page, and you've got just you know bunches and bunches of images, and they're maybe they're I don't know 20, 30 pictures. Well, if the web page has to load all those images before it's finished that's not such a great experience because it'll still be spinning up at the top, but if it has lazy loading. It'll load the, the images that show on the screen and stop. So it's it, as far as the user's concerned, the page is loaded and, um, and then they scroll up and the pages load and they scroll up more and more pay, more images load, excuse me. And it makes the, experience feel um, more smooth and, and, and quick. Then there's the theme. Um, with Elementor, so it, it's choosing a theme is diff, it, it's important in different ways than you might might have been before Elementor. Um, if you were going to use a theme, 
or you build, you, you know, so I'm sure a lot of you that are in this call, um, have built your own themes. I messed around with it for a while in the early days, but, um, the time it took for, to do it and the amount of money that my clients at the time were willing to pay didn't match up. So I would use themes, um, that were already made, but today it's different because Elementor has grown into basically being able to build out the whole website completely. So you want to use a lightweight theme designed for page builders if you can. Um, now there's Elementor about a year ago, I think came out with their own theme called hello theme. And it's, it's just stripped down. It's kind of like a scaffolding to hang Elementor on. Um, there's Astra theme, um, which I use. Um, there, all these themes that I've listed here have free versions. Um, there's a, some paid versions or paid add-ons to, to Astra, there's Astra Pro, which I use. Uh, Generate Press has, I think, their paid version. They have a free version, but their paid version, I think, is called Generate Press Premium, um, I think. Um, and then, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. I think it's Nevi. Um, I've not used that. So um, but these are ones that I think in some documentation or an article I read from Elementor, they mentioned these. So I throw those in there. Um, and this last bullet point, um, try to find a modular theme that allows you to pick only the features that you want. And I've got a little screen capture from uh, inside of Astra Pro, which is the add-on that you add to Astra to make it a little bit more uh, capable. And you'll, you'll notice that, and there are more options that, that are here that more options than show up here, but most, most all of these are not even active. Only ones that are active are the custom layouts and the scroll to top. Um, custom layouts allows me to inject um, code into certain places, um, you know, whether it be through, if I need to, anything from adding Google Analytics or Facebook pixels or other kinds of tracking code, or maybe I want to um, add an action to a hook. I can do that. I find that very useful. And then this one down here, scroll to top. I always hate having to manually scroll back to the top of the page. So I always put a little arrow at the bottom right of my pages for to click on to take you back to the top. So, Take, take this and, you know, try some of these if you haven't already, or maybe you've already picked one out that you like. Um, but at Elementor theoretically works with almost anything, but it works better with these. I was working on a site this week that I didn't build that um, needed to have some functionality added to it that this, the theme couldn't do. And so I threw Elementor in there and, I was able to get it to work, but it was not easy because it wasn't uh, it wasn't really Elementor friendly. So these these and there are some others. Uh, Ocean WP is a one that um, I've heard good things about. So you know, just do your homework, but hopefully this will help. Then we can think about our plugin. Do you have any redundant plugins like sliders, contact forms, social share buttons, pop-ups? There's a lot of functions that have are often uh, managed by plugins that Elementor Pro can do for you now. Uh, you know, this doesn't work in every instance, but you know, explore what all the options are. You might be able to get get done. Um, with what you want to get done using Elementor Pro. Um, I, will, I will use the Elementor Pro uh, forms 
on occasion, but I normally, I almost always use gravity farms because it has a lot of functionality, but I elementary pro forms are beginning to add their own functionality. So maybe one day they will be as function functionality rich as gravity forms, but, um, I've used, the pop-ups, I've replaced pop-up plugins with Elementor's pop-up feature. Um, never use a social share plugin um, because that's built into WordPress. So when you're looking at your plugins, are some of these plugins, can they be replaced by Elementor Pro? Um, and as Elementor comes out with new, new functions, you might find that, well, I can get rid of this plugin. I don't need it now. There were a number of plugins that um, I didn't need anymore when they came out with the team builder. So um, make sure your plugins are up to date. Uh, aside from the security issue, I had uh, um, three sites that were affected by a zero day vulnerability two days ago, zero day meaning that they found out about the vulnerability after it started happening um, and it was because the plugin wasn't up to date and, but they, I, we got them all fixed and, um, but plugins are, it's always good in terms of speed and functionality. It's always, you want to keep your plugins, your themes and WordPress up to date. Um, then for element or add on plugins, try to use a modular one of those too. You know, there's um I've got an example here, ultimate add-ons for Elementor, but there's other ones like um, plus add-ons for Elementor. Um, I think the crock of uh tools have are modular. They, I believe many of them have gone to being modular, meaning that you only activate the things that you need. And in this list here, the again, I truncated the list because it goes down further. Um, only one you see active here is gravity form styler. I use that to kind of make the gravity forms not quite so generic and plain Jane. And this allows me to do that, but I've got these all turned off. I don't need them. And, um, it just, it doesn't have to put all this extra stuff in the database. So, so that's on your, your plugins. Then your images. And here is a big opportunity to impact speed. Because on average, images comprise about half the file size of an average website, according to HTTP archive. And there's different ways to go about doing it. Um, there's image optimization in terms of sizing the image to the appropriate use case. Um, can't tell you how many times I've, I've built a site or had some taken over a site somebody else built, but I built a site and then turned it over to the customer and then they might want me to come in to do something on the website and I'm looking at their featured image for a post. Um, and they, it, the, the space on even on the, the post itself is that it, it would take up is only eight or 900 pixels wide, but they've got a 5,000 pixel wide image being loaded into that. And of course it's being squeezed down. Um, I see that a lot. So, um, so, and then I make a point here, largest instance of image. So what does that mean? Let's see here. Get back up. Let's try to escape out of this. Here we go. I'm gonna um, go to the. Where do I have that? Here we go. Yeah, let's see. I'm um, stop sharing. Let me choose a different share. I'm going to show. Where is it? There we go. Okay, that should be good. Are y'all seeing my uh, browser? 
Yes, we are, Terry. But okay. So this is a, a site that I built recently for a marketing firm. And um let's look at these. These are the featured images that are associated with the um the post. So let's take a look at this featured image. A featured image is used actually it can be used in multiple places, but I want to show you it's used in two places. So here it's a small image, and here it's a bigger image. But how big do we want to make this image? Well, we don't want to make it this size because if it, in the bigger image, it's going to get pixelated. But there's actually an, ins an instance where the image is going to be bigger. Um, like right here. So you want to go to that, kind of go through uh, to the um, first, the wide part of the tablet um, setup. So if we go to inspect that image, I can see that it's 893 pixels wide at that size. So I might want to say, okay, the, I'm going to make the images for the featured image is 900 pixels wide. And I don't need to have it be a thousand pixels wide or 2000 pixels wide. Um, and that, that, that can work. And so let's go back to, let's see here, let's present and share. Get this out of the way. Okay. Are y'all seeing the presentation? We are. Okay. Okay, cool. So then um, we can swap out images. Using the responsive feature, you can load different image sizes per the device size. So we'll do this again and we'll where's our browser uh, I need to hit escape okay uh, we'll go back to this one okay and we'll share this okay so this is a just a simple Actually, this is a template I loaded into um, our demo site we were working on last last month. And we don't want this big image. I think I looked at it. It was 1,600 pixels wide. We don't want this image to have to be loaded onto mobile. So if we do an inspect on that image, I can see that it's um, at least displaying at 500 pixels wide. If I go into the developer tools, I can see that it's actually smaller than that. And let's see what's happening. How, how are they doing this? They're swapping out images depending on the viewport. So let's go to the pages. Here we go. Responsive demo, edit with Elementor. Simple, simple to do. Okay, so we start out, and this is our section, and we have this in the style, we have this image, which is like 1600 pixels wide. Then we, and that's a desktop. Then we go to tablet, it uses the same image. But when we go to mobile, it's not that same image shrunk down. It's a different image. And 
because we can kind of get a hint here. Like we go to desktop, we've got the image, go to tablet. It's not showing anything because it's inherited the image from the desktop. But then we go to mobile and it's a different image. If we go to, um, we can kind of see that if we go to the media library. We can see that we have this image, which is 460 by 307, which is the one that's being used on mobile. And this one is 1600 by 1067. That's 179 kilobytes. That one's 28 kilobytes. And those have been those haven't even been optimized yet. So one's like what's that? Five six times bigger than the other one, uh, size wise. So that's definitely something to consider. Yeah, okay. Now let's get back to our. Uh, we're still sharing. Let's see what are we sharing right now. Rome. Okay. Then we'll. Go back here. Okay. So we've got, um, we talked about swapping out images. Then there's image compression. You can do it before you add it to the website. You know, you've size, you figured out what the right size is going to be. And, um, and let's say if you work with Photoshop, you can compress the image, you know, um, JPEG has certain certain amount of compression. There's all kinds of software that photo editing software that can uh, compress images. Um, with JPEGs, you got to be careful because particularly if you have something that has a gradient. Let's say you have a sky, you know, like a sunset. If you compress the image too much, you'll get banding, um, sort of like the old old gifs of the the early 2000s and the late 1990s um so you want to compress them make as small as possible but without having too much loss of quality um you could also use a a um a website called tinypng.com that's particularly good for ping files i haven't found that it does much better than photoshop on uh, JPEGs, but you can take a ping file, um, particularly, you know, like the ones that have to have, usually we'll use ping files if we have to have a transparent background or we're doing something that isn't an image like a photograph. Uh, ping files work okay. And tiny PNG will really, I mean, reduce the size down by 60%, 70%, and you can't tell the difference. So I, I use that on occasion. Or you can you can compress your images after you add them to your website. There's plugins that you can install on your website that as you add images to the media library, they get compressed by the software. And you can set the settings as to how much you want to compress them. Um, I've listed three here. Smush is free. Um, much, I don't know if it has a paid version. Um, short pixel you have to pay for, but I got it on, uh, as a AppSumo deal. So I, I pay, I don't remember what I paid for it, but I paid like probably $49 or $39 and I have it for life. So, and then, uh, Imageify has a free version. So, um, give those a shot. So what happens is you load your, your image and these, these plugins compress the images for you. And um, and I know with like for instance short pixel you can um, if for some reason you want to restore it to its original size you can um, so taking care of your images is important in speeding up your Elementor site um, so I think that gets that so then we'll talk about a, a CDN this and this kind of illustrates. The, um, how the CDN works. The um, I'll just read what this says. The content delivery network speeds up your site's global load times by caching your static content 
on a huge network of edge servers all around the world. Um, and the edge server is one that is really close to where your users are. Um, and this, this graphic kind of explains it. Let's say this is where you, you are or your server is. And these little blue doohickeys, map markers, are edge servers. And they're all over the world. And um, your files are distributed to all these servers. And um, let's, let's get out of this. Let me escape out of this. Escape. Um, we'll look at something here. This image that we were talking about, I think I'm going to open it in a new tab. And you'll see this is the CDN URL. It's, it, you know, instead of it saying michaelmckenzie.com slash WP content, that's, that's the CDN. For, that's WP Engine CDN. So it's pulling this image not from my website, or this isn't my website, but from Michael McKenzie's website. It's pulling it from, I don't know where this is, but it's, 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 it's this close to the location, to my location. So that can speed things up, and that's very helpful. And there are, as I mentioned, it's very helpful to have the CDN be part of your hosting package, which it is with WP Engine, and I'm sure it is with many other um, many other ones. So um, let's get back to presenting. And there are Elementor recommended CDNs right here. I believe Brian has these links that he can put in, if he hasn't already put into the chat. Um, I hear a lot of pretty much good things about Cloudflare. I think it's maybe a little, it might be challenging to set up, but it's, from what I hear, it's very fast. And, and um, I hear a lot of good things about that. So um, some people may have some thoughts on um, what, their experiences with a CDN and what might be the best kind. So um, that being said, where do we go from here? You know, so, well, what's next is we're going to, we're going to do a part two to this um, series, if you will. And we're going to next month get into performance optimization plugins, you know, things like, um, WP Rocket, that, that comes to mind. Nitro Pack, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and go through them and see how they work, which is best. There are some that are free, there are some that are paid. Probably going to find that the paid ones are do more for you and do a better job, but maybe a, a free one could get things done, get things done the way you want be done they can um, minify your html css and javascript you can deal with the help you deal with the infamous render blocking css and javascript though you have to be careful with some of these things that's why it's good to test them on a staging server because you can break stuff um, and I've, I've broken stuff i broke stuff with wp rocket when i was first playing with it never how many years ago it was um you, a lot of these plugins will do caching although you you don't really need too much ca if you have a host that has caching you might not need the caching um there's a lot of things that can be a lot of little check boxes and dials you can turn so to speak to really tweak um uh, your website and we're going to try to go into that as much as possible and as much as time permits um, next month. And we're also going to talk about uh, cleaning up your database, which is scary, can be scary, uh, but we're going to try to make it not scary uh, because lots of crud gets in the database over time. 
Um, if your website, for instance, um, if your website or keeps revisions, um, I don't know if you've ever no noticed in the up at the top right of a of a post or a page where it, you know it says publish or uh, the date and stuff, and then it might say revisions. And I've been on websites that um, you know for a client, and a page will have it'll say thirty seven revisions. So there's 37 revisions of this page floating around in the database, and there's 100 pages on this website. How much crap is on that web in that database? So um, let's clean up the database. And I'm I'm sure we'll come up with some other things, but I'm trying to think about what I can fit in and in, uh, in about an hour um, to get a head start. I didn't give you this link. Um, for um, Brian, but hopefully you can. They will be able to to see it um, when the the replay. Or I put the title of the YouTube video in there. You might be able to find it. Paul C at WT Tuts did a video called six, He compared six top WordPress caching plugins, and he tested them and ranked them. He tested them on a on the same site, he would back up the site, test the, the plugin on it, go to the backup, make another backup, test the new plugin on the new site, new clean version of the site, do these tests and compare it how they behaved and kind of got some interesting results. And you can see how it's done if you want to get a head start on that. Um, and and he, he, he calls them cache plugins, but they do a lot more than caching. They do um, the minifications, they do optimizing, um, all kinds of stuff. So, um, and I think that's all I have for this session. Um, I thought I had a questions and answer. Oh, I got them out of order. So I guess at this point we can open it up to questions um, or comments or whatever you'd like. So um, there were a couple of questions. I'll open it up. There were a couple of questions okay. in the chat. Um, just give me a second. Let me find the first one. Um, Carrie, did, this is from Juan. Juan. Okay. Roll down. Carrie, do you know or use Cadence theme? No, I've heard of it and I've heard uh, a lot of people talk about it. Um, what I tend to do, and it may be a good thing and it may be a bad thing, is if I find a theme that I like and it works, I try to stay with it because. Um, in the early days of my doing um, web development, you know, I'd have 10 different websites with 10 different themes, and it's hard to remember where all the everything is and all these things. So once I find a theme that I, back then, find a theme that I liked, I would stay with it so I didn't have to relearn a theme every time. Um, but I've heard good things about it. Um, I believe, I'm trying to remember the guy at, uh, um, oh shoot, the little ball headed guy with the black shirt. Um, That's WP Crafter. Yeah, WP Crafter. I think he 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 likes it. Um, yeah, I, I just put the YouTube the, video in the in the chat for for WP Crafter for the thing about Cadence. Adam. Yeah, 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 yeah. Adam. Yeah, yeah, Karen's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I saw him at WordCamp Nashville, Nashville is U.S. WordCamp USA, uh, 2019, and in real life he's looks he's a lot smaller than he seems on YouTube. <laughs> of course, I'm a pretty big fella. I probably look smaller than I am in <laughs> real life on on screen, um, but he's a nice guy. So yeah, that's why I had seen it before. Um, 
Has anybody else had any experience with cadence? Any thoughts? It's lightweight. I've used it. It's good. Yeah, I've used it okay. too. It, it's good. I mean, um, I use it in, with a WooCommerce. Uh, they, they have one, a Cadence WooCommerce um, one, and I didn't have any complaints. I agree with her. Do you find it's helpful for WooCommerce specifically? Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. You said we, we had have, other questions, Brian. Yes, we also have a question from Drazen. Um, with WP Engine buying Genesis, how does Elementor integrate with Genesis and Genesis Pro? How does Elementor integrate with it? How does Elementor integrate with Genesis and Genesis Pro with WP Engine buying Genesis? How does Elementor integrate with Genesis and Genesis Pro? Drazen, if you want to um, uh, further articulate your question, that'd be great. I think from what I gathered that um, Elementor works fine with Genesis. Um, I don't think Genesis is not designed to work with Elementor, but Elementor is a, can work with most themes because uh, Genesis is kind of a um, kind of a special case because um, Genesis is like a framework, and then you the actual is. It, Themes. This is as, how, as I understand it. Hopefully, it's still this way because I've messed around with it. Um, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a framework, and then you buy child themes that you can actually that are actually act act like themes. On um, in the when you build your sites, so um, Genesis is not built to use page builders, but I believe you can use the, use it in there. Does anybody have any China? Uh, experience when? Sure, jump in. Yeah, um, basically when, uh, if you use something like Genesis, um, what Elementor or Beaver Builder or any page builder um, is going to allow you to modify what's called the content. So in WordPress, there's a function called the content that that displays the content of whatever page you're on and Elementor will jump in and you'll be able to modify that content, but not the stuff at the top, not the stuff at the bottom, not the footer, not the header, but the content um, of, of that page. And then the reason why you want to use something like hello um, as opposed to Genesis is that that's going to allow you to design your header and your footer in Elementor, Ver Elementor Pro, I should, if I'm saying that correctly. I'm, I'm not a big Elementor guy. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I might, I've built a few, but not, not a ton. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's why you want to use kind of like a vanilla, you know, what Elementor recommends, because uh, that way you right. can control the whole, as every aspect of the page. Correct. Aaron's right. And he brings up a an important point to me in my decisions about going full in with Elementor. Um, Cause I was, you know, when I came out with, you know, there was a period of time, I don't know, it was probably three years ago, maybe four years ago, where there was kind of a, who's going to win between Beaver Builder and Elementor. And, and then I, and I tried both and I was like, well, it's kind of good, but, you know, it's just another page builder because most themes have, or a lot of themes had page builders and, and yeah, there's some cool stuff, but when Elementor got to where they had the theme builder, I was sold because basically you, you, you need, you need to kind of, you, you kind of have to, you need a theme to hang the Elementor on. But Elementor can build everything that a theme can. If you've ever uh, looked at, you know, you buy a theme, uh, you know, buy a theme, 
and install it and then look at the and they go to the editor and you see all these files like single.php and archive.php and post.php and all these files um, they're template files well you in the theme builder with elementor you you create an elementor version of those but you have so much more flexibility that i can have a different kind of post using the other terminology I can have a different kind of PA uh, post template for every category if I want to. Um, I can um, have different headers for different kinds of pages. I can have a different header for different users. It, it's because of uh, uh, the display conditions and such. Uh, we covered some of that, I think, last month. Um, it's just so much more flexible. And one of the other big reasons that I gravitated towards Elementor is I don't know if y'all have anybody who does client work. You, if you were using a sort of a pre-made theme um, and you're, you have these customers that say, well, I want it to do this. And you have to go to make the theme do what the customer wants. You have to, I would have to go in and write a bunch of custom code around it to make it do what they want to do. Cause customers are always wanting something out of left field. It seems like, well, I want, you know, I want, I want the search. I want the search button to have the icon. And, and when they hover over it, I want it to open up. And then when they go away, I want it to close. Or no, I don't want it to close. I want it to stay open. And all these little things. Um, with Elementor, I can do just about anything. Um, and that's so, that's why. <laughs> so. so on that note, so, Carrie, I, yeah. I don't want to spread doom and gloom, but I did watch, uh, y'all mentioned Adam. And he actually has the new video out that everyone should go and watch about the latest uh, WordPress that was just released. And in that video, he mentioned something about us not getting too hung up on our page builders because of kind of what your presentation covered today. And that's basically because of the Google uh, and, and that we were probably needing to go back and get used to the Gutenberg blocks because the update of WordPress 5.7 actually made improvements in the Gutenberg to hit the Google, the new Google algorithm. So well, just a little share. Point, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I've been watching and waiting on Gutenberg for, was it been? three years now since they dropped it on the world um, at WordCamp, WordCamp USA. Um, and when it gets to a maturity, we, you know, we'll see. Um, but, well, that's you know, I guess we have to balance, I guess we have to balance what we technically want and what our customers want. And I, I imagine there's a lot of things still that we can do with Elementor that you can't do with Gutenberg, but I know Gutenberg's making a lot of progress, but certainly want to. Uh, yeah, I'll, I, oh, I, I, I was just going to add, but, that's not to mean that Elementor won't catch up and add the new, you know, uh, Google, excuse me, Google, improvements or what enhancements because i know that they now joined with yoast and actually i started using uh, rank math and it's also entwined with elementor so i don't see Ele um, elementor kind of running away from the uh or maybe trying to compete with the gutenberg but probably will make improvements to match that okay mm -hmm. well i in and I also wonder about um, the direction of Elementor 
because um, when they came out with the theme builder, I was thinking, wow, you don't even really need a theme anymore. And, um, and, and some of the elementary leader um, uh, webinars where the, the, we would have an opportunity to talk to some of the, 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 the co-founders and some of the lead developers, uh, it was getting hints that, you know, they were moving, they had really big plans. Like is, you almost wondered, are they going to get to a place to where they don't even need WordPress anymore? Um, but I don't think that's where they're going. I think where they're going is going to be, you know, doing something like what oxygen is doing where you don't need a theme. Cause in fact, with oxygen, you put it in and it disables all the, any theme function at all. You do everything in, in, um, that, that plugin. So I, I want, I wonder if that's where elementary is going. Um, yeah, but, so uh, yeah. our uh, sorry to interrupt. So our experience as an SEO company, uh, we're headquartered in Canada, and uh, we have mm -hmm. clients. So most of our pages are fairly long and pretty heavy to load, uh, because they do have about you know fifteen hundred to two thousand words. We do have sliders, we have review sliders, and things like this. So. Um, we really liked how Elementor was in the back end, how the front end page builder looked and felt. Um, and even though our clients don't really use it, we like that image because we want to portray a popular, you know, cutting edge image. And we felt like Elementor was doing this. But the problem was that no matter what we did, we just couldn't get that speed up. It was way too sluggish. And, you know, we've spent a ton of hours trying to trying to get it up to speed. So then we also tried Beaver Builder, which, which was loading faster, but it was still too sluggish for us because of these sliders and because of some of these API connections that we had to have on the pages. So just recently, we actually are trying out uh, Genesis Pro. And that's why I asked this question, uh, because as you know, WP Engine bought them. And the main thing that, that was really helping us build sites more quickly uh, were the element packs. Um, so these mm -hmm. are basically pre-built uh, blocks, right? That just allow us to just dr drag and drop them in there and change CSS to style them. And for us, it's all about figuring out how to build pages as fast as possible. And I was at the WordComp in Toronto uh, two years ago and all the guys there that were presenting were saying Gutenberg or Gutenberg as most people call it will become the de facto standard. And um, you, we're gonna, there's gonna be switching costs sooner or later for anybody that's using front end page builders like Elementor or Beaver Builder or whichever, right? Or Divi. Uh, you know, and like they didn't know at that time because it was too early and, you know, Gun, Gunberg had bad reviews. Uh, it wasn't really doing much. But now with Genesis Pro, that's changed a lot. And they do have a lot of, uh, a lot of these blocks, not as good as some of these blocks for Elementor and Beaver Builder, mm -hmm. but the speed gains are substantial, right? So, and this is one of the main things, right? Especially now with, you know, the core, core uh, web vitals coming out from Google and, you know, right. just the, the whole speed issue, right? And um, mm -hmm. I just like, we, we just want to give up on Elementor because we can't get it up to speed. And I'd love to see somebody who has experience to try to, you know, speed up our, some of our client sites, see how, far, how fast we can push it. Well, some of the things you mentioned um, in and of themselves slow down a site, um, like bringing, and you mentioned that bringing in reviews, um, like, I don't know what kind of reviews you're talking about, but I know that I have a few clients, I don't know, half a dozen that have um, pull in Google reviews from Google and that slows things down tremendously you think google would be zippy fast but um you can you can look at the waterfall and you'll see that um pulling in particularly the um the, um, the gravitars of course you can with some of these optimization plugins you can turn that off um and just have the you know the their, their let's say their name is Drazen, instead of having your gravatar, you just have a D uh, there. But um, pulling in 
scripts and content from third party sites can really slow things down and you don't have any control over that. Um, sliders, I guess it depends on the slider. Um, there are simple sliders. Um, and then there's sliders like uh, revolution slider, which was all the rage years ago. Um, hugely bulky and, but you can do some cool stuff with it. Um, I think, I think we'll just have to to see. Um, I know that Elementor is has worked in the past year on cutting out some of the bloat in their code. Um, that was one of the big things in 3.0, um, and they um, are working to I- improve that even more. So, um, but if you found something that that works better with Genesis. Um, and Genesis Pro, you know, I'm all for what what works for you. Go with it. Mm. And um, but uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'll, I'll uh, I need to look into that to that more because I've seen um, uh, there's a lot of things happening, and you always have to weigh what's what's best. What's the best option? Um, I I mentioned oxygen. I see a lot of people getting excited about that. Um, um, and there, and this is not even WordPress, but I see one of the, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Dave Foy, the guy who, uh, who was a big, big elementor teacher on the internet. He wrote a, he made a really good course called No Stress WordPress. He's now decided that he's he's wants to do Webflow, um, which is um, kind of a hybrid between um, Wix and WordPress, I guess. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to, to skin the proverbial cat, but um, right now. I, I, well, we're staying. I'm staying with with uh, Elementor until I have a reason not to. Um, but it's always good to hear about other things, other technologies, and that's what word camps are for. And I wish we could get back to having word camps. So. Dave's presentation was on Webflow, and I'm actually looking at that too. <laughs> he he was yeah. moving from WordPress to Webflow. Yes. Yeah, and he's he's really jazzed about it, and I understand his logic. Yeah, and I um, me too. I have the same conundrum. Like for instance, I I do work with clients all the time, and sometimes, especially with WooCommerce, there tends to be lots of plugins that are needed, and I am such an old school streamlined code person that that bothers me having that many plugins mm-hmm. to have to work mm-hmm. with. And I would rather, you know, keep my site streamlined, which we wouldn't have all this trouble with G-metrics and everything else we have to look at. (laughs) But I don't know. I'm still testing it out, trying to theorize if it's possible to work as fast Um, because I'm not a Webflow person yet. I don't work that fast trying to figure things out. (laughs) Yeah, and and I guess it... um... You know, uh, there are a lot of us that, or I don't know if there's a lot, but there's a, no, a number of us that do this for a living. And do I have time to spend ever how long it takes to learn a new platform when I could be building websites and billing hours? Exactly. Um, exactly. And then <laughs> until I get convinced that there's a better way, and I, I do spend a lot of time testing things and researching things. Probably 25, 30% of my work day over, you know, averaged out over a month is actually not doing billable work, but learning new stuff. And um, because the technology just moves so fast. So um let me know what you think about Webflow if you're if you're pursuing that. Um, I'd be interested. You know, maybe just as a side project to see, play with it. Yeah, that's what um, I'm trying to do. 
um, play with it. But again, it's finding the time and I'm kind of forcing myself to find time right now. <laughs> I hear you. Hey, Carrie, okay, we've got a little bit of time yeah. left, but um, JW and Doug have questions. They've been uh, having their hand raised for a while. Okay, shoot. JW, uh, what's your question? Hello, JW. Well, oh, while JW is thinking about it, Doug, what's your question? Uh, it's just a, a comment regarding Elementor and speed. Uh, it's been troubling me a bit too, especially for mobile. That's always been the thing. You know, getting a good desktop score for Core Web Vitals is not that difficult, but for mobile it is. And I've gone back to the last five sites that I've built with Elementor and I realized that, hey, I'm adding these intersections into sections and I didn't really need them. And so I started to parse mm -hmm tables out and divs and things like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Containers where images go, setting it up so that the image exactly matches the container width, as opposed to, because they'll punish you for making a site a, a image that's a little bit bigger than what the container goes through. Um, and I actually was able to push scores pretty high, you know, get an extra 15 points out of it on mobile, just doing some simple. Yeah. It's just- Yeah, you, you can- uh, Simple, that's all, <laughs> really. Yeah, if you- um... It, rather than using nested columns inside a section, you can sometimes accomplish the same things by using padding and margins. Right. Um, you know, there, there's different ways to do that. And, um, and then something, you know, sometimes I do this, that the content that is on a desktop version of a website or a web page, there's nothing that says that all that content needs to be on the mobile version. You know, um, you have to, I've, I've um, served up a, a, I don't know how to describe the right word for it, a distilled version of that page to, to people. Um, sometimes maybe, maybe there's images that are not necessary. Um, Maybe, you know, it might have an image that's a, with some text, but maybe it's not necessary. And images take up a lot of, a lot of bandwidth, yeah. at least as far as mobile goes. So there's all kinds of tricks. And I, re I, removed this, I removed a slider that was not a full width slider. It was only like 600 mm -hmm. pixels wide and I removed it and got an extra 10 points out of the mobile. Simple mm -hmm. things like this and just thinking simply yeah, I, building mobile. Sure. So, what I did on a restaurant site, um, this wasn't Elementor because I, I built it before our, uh, Elementor. I, ha I was using Elementor, but it's the Silver Skillet restaurant downtown. It's evidently a famous old restaurant. It's just a diner. On their homepage, it's just one big slider, you know, and, and, um, and there's two or three slides. But on their mobile version, that, that slider has gone. It's just the first, the first slide of the slider, 600 pixels wide. And that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And of course, if it was going to try to load that slider on the mobile, you know, people could go out and have a nap while they're waiting for that page to load. But with just the, the little image, it loads up fast. So it's all kinds of things to be done. Looks hey, like we're... Carrie, J, JW just had a question, um, real quick one about how does it look? How does it look for the new changes in May in terms of your overall score when your site has a lot of images but it's using lazy loading? Well, if it's using lazy loading, that's going to help. Um, the images that you are that are being loaded you still want to make sure they're optimized, um, you know, with, you know, compression, uh, are they make sure they're not any bigger than they need to be pixel wise, as well as byte wise. Um, but the, the lazy loading will help, um, cause those, those scores are taking what, what do people see when they first load the page? 
and then there's the total load time, but I don't, I don't think that's that important because they're not seeing it. They're not, they're not experiencing it. And the language I've seen in some of the Google documents about these kinds of things, they are, they're using, um, using phrases like user experience. Um, they're, they're focusing on what is it, the experience of using that web site or that web page like. Um, so if it's outside of the experience, there, it's maybe not so important. So if you're managing your images properly, I think you'd probably be okay. I think, unless someone disagrees. Okay. Well, we are 37. Okay. Well, I really do appreciate all the participation and the people showing up. As I mentioned, I think at the outset, we are recording this and we will uh, post the recording. Uh, usually I get it posted the next day and then I'll send a link out to all the people who are SVP. And um, thank you for coming and y'all have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you. Back everyone. at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good to see you again too, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. And, thank you. And nice goodbye, you. Karen. Thank you, guys. Karen. Thanks a million. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. Andrea, Michelle, JL, bye. Bye. Andrea. Thank you. Yep. See you later. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.